record. Great. And we have a spirit seeking peace and joy and happiness. And it's always right here with us in the moment for us to tune into. So when we meditate, we don't meditate to tune out the world, but to tune into ourselves to experience ourselves and the world and each other. So when you practice mindfulness, it's loving yourself. It's saying, I hear you. It's accepting what's here. It's having patience with yourself and your mind and your body and your aches and pains. It's not judging. It's not striving to fix it or get rid of it. It's trusting the moment. It's letting things go and letting them be. So let's just sit for a few moments, training our puppy dog's mind to be here now, to pay attention, to keep the heart open. And when the mind wanders, which it will, we just come back to the moment, to the breath, to the body, to our awareness of what's here and now. Keep the awareness within and acknowledging today is an important day in history of D-Day and maybe recall for yourself some memories, some thoughts, some images that come to you for that day, people you know, relatives, friends, what that history means to you, to the U.S. to the world, to history, as it's being acknowledged and celebrated, commemorated in ceremonies today in Normandy. So today, as you open the eyes, I'm going to be sharing with you my experience of Normandy since I was just there two weeks ago. And uh, I have some photos and, and a video. To share with you. Um, and my experience and happy birthday, Francis. Happy uh, birthday. Uh, 103? 102. 102. If, if you, by the way, thanks. 
If you, by the way, that's, you, got, you want to change? You want to leave it? Yeah, you can leave it on. But okay. As you scroll, I mean, if you leave it on for a little bit, it's gonna time out. Oh, I got, got it. I got it. Okay. You got to touch it occasionally. Okay. Um, so if you watch the ceremonies, which I did this morning, they're honoring many of the soldiers who are still alive. And your brother is still alive. How old is he? He'll be 100. So, Francis, do you know any of those people? Are they your good buddies? No. Do you remember D-Day? Do you, you want to share uh, something from you? Big event? It was a big event. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it was a big event. So I'm going to share my personal experience. Uh, Jason was also there. So he's got some feelings, experiences to share at some point. Um, and we may have time, hopefully, at the end, my niece, who I traveled with, just put together, I just got it this morning, an eight-minute video that she's giving to my sister, whose 80th birthday is in July. She was in my mother's womb on D-Day. So we may get a chance to see that at the end. My niece put together a nice eight-minute video of our experience. But these are some slides that I wanted to go through with you. And uh, this first one, and I want to relate it to this class because it's a class of mind, body, health, mind, body, healing. I would, I would move it. Time out and got it. Got it. Okay. So, so this is 630 Utah Beach, 1944 D Day. I would learn. My sister went there on the 70th anniversary and did research on my father's experience to find out that he was in the first wave in the 4144 Quartermaster Corps arriving at Utah Beach on D-Day. And so I made the trip because we never spoke about it. And a lot of people never spoke about their experiences. And it's a double-edged sword. We hold in the pain in protecting ourselves. And on the other, it, it prevents and delays healing. Because healing is being willing to face the, the pain or the grief, whether it's a loss. And there's no right or wrong. So for me, it was, this trip was, what was my father's experience? Could I relive it? And I hired a guide uh, to take us around Normandy, but he knew my father's company and we knew what his job was. He was in the quartermaster corps. He was a master sergeant. And part of their job is to recover, identify, and bury the dead bodies. So his job was to do that. And he was in the first wave. And Utah Beach was a wave before even Omaha Beach. So they got lucky at Utah Beach. There was a fight. People were killed. But it was nothing like what happened on Omaha Beach semi-slaughter. But those dead bodies had to be brought from the front because more soldiers kept coming. And I would learn in the museums and reading history, um, they had a lot of respect for the dead bodies and they wanted to get them off the battlefield as quickly as possible for many different reasons. And I was just imagining that was my father's job. So that was my experience and my niece was with me. So you're going to see the story of our experience um, and I'll talk more about it. On a personal note, because of my Normandy, it shaped who I am and what I do for the career that I do. Because of his experience there, not just that, but a number of other experiences, he suffered, as many soldiers did, with PTSD. And we know that that's not a nice thing to live through and survive. Many of his fellow soldiers from the war, as I was growing up, many of them committed suicide, which was something that soldiers do to deal with the trauma and pain. My dad, obviously, he survived. I got born, but he suffered with anxiety, depression. He was sent to like a one floor with the cuckoo's nest place for the army. He had shock treatments to have them come back. And so we now know there's something called epigenetics, where you you carry the trauma. Children of Holocaust had PTSD, even though they weren't in the war. 
the, all of Israel now and all of Gaza, people are going through PTSD from the traumas of war. So for me, that was something I never spoke to my dad about. And then he died at the young age of 55, having bypass surgery. He died on the operating table. And so this is one of my big regrets was that I never asked him to tell me his story. So the first mind body doctor, whatever the person is, mental, emotional, all the doctors, drugs, treatments, herbs, vitamins, meditation, whatever it is, tell me your story. What happened? Why are you in my office here with these symptoms? Is there a connection between your biography and your biology? So that motivated me in my career to bring this element in medicine because part of me wished somebody had been able to help my dad maybe even a little better than they were at that time. And we're still learning about how to heal, treat trauma. So that was a beat, and that was the first place I went. And this is a, a movie that I have that we may show later. I have, I'll give it to you, Jason. Uh, I also visited the World War II Museum, which is in um, New Orleans. Um, my the my Higgins sister, Higgins the Higginsburg Factory. Factory, too. Yeah, there's a lot. Of... Okay, so this is this is the Higginsburg. This is what they they were prepared to go, but the weather was no good. So they stayed in these boats, cramped in boats, waiting to go, knowing what they were up against. And Eisenhower to the front and was talking to them. And they crossed the English Channel 35 miles in windy, rainy weather, getting ready to face the beaches with the German guns pointed at them. And they were in these boats. And this, as you know, is the uh, context of beaches of Normandy, uh, Utah Beach, Omaha Beach, Gold Beach, Juneau Sword, and different soldiers and different units, Canadian, uh, British, on the different beaches. There's a lot of history, uh, as Jason may share too. When you go to Normandy, how many people have been to Normandy? So you all know, there's museums everywhere, memorials everywhere. The French are very, I wasn't aware and they were living under German occupation. Uh, and so this is the liberation of, of France for them, as well as the uh, uh, conquering the beaches as a beachhead for soldiers, which is important in my father's job, which was supplying soldiers. So uh, he traveled with the infantry, making sure they had their guns and this and that. And then when they died, his job was to bury them. That's what the, his, 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 his work was. Um, just get the picture. Hello? Yeah, here we are. We're here. So now we're going this way. Okay, next one. This is it. This is an article that my sister wrote years ago when she came back from Normandy, which said, trying to heal the pain, dad prevented healing. So my sister and I would discuss over the years my father's trauma, and we shared and helped heal each other from the pain that we went through because our father was suffering, but nobody ever talked to us about it. Nobody ever said, your dad was a soldier in the war and he suffered from trauma. We just kind of lived with it. People didn't talk. So the context here is talk about yourself, your history to your, to your, to your children, okay? This is a commendation and there's a video I did. This is a commendation. My father won a bronze star for his service. So I'm just going to read part of it to you because it speaks to, to me like what he did. Again, for me, it's reliving my father's experience. One is knowing it. The other is being at the beaches of Normandy and imagining he was there on D-Day. And it says, immediately uh, a medal for outstanding performance of duty in connection with the success of the quartermaster supply operations during the Normandy campaign. Now, as a supply sergeant, they carried guns. They had to fight too, but their job was an infantry. Their job was to support the infantry with supplies. And again, he was in what's called graves registration, which is making sure the bodies got buried and identified because many got sent back. 
Immediately upon landing in France with the 54th Quartermaster Base Depot, they called the places where they set up depots and they called them dumps. Uh, that was the name they gave for it. During the height of the battle for the beaches, that again acknowledged he was there on the first wave, Sergeant Epstein devoted his time and energy to the emergency conditions relative to the burial of military personnel returned from nearby front lines to the American cemeteries established in his general area. Um, in the words of the citation which accompanied awards, in addition to his duties as chief clerk of the Graves Registration Division, Master Sergeant Epstein developed and maintained and organized equipment and personal effects done for all services and personnel. This was a mission not contemplated by the tables of organization and division of under which he worked and operated. Appraising Sergeant Epstein's performance in the handling of supply records and citation continued. Master Sergeant Epstein was able to at all times through the superior administration of his dump apprise all units of their critically needed organizational equipment. So as they were coming in, the soldiers were coming in, what soldiers came when they finally conquered. You clean up the, clean up the battlefield, uh, identify, recover, identify the bodies, bury them, and then make sure they have all of the equipment that they need to keep moving forward. That was in the support staff. So that's that's what he lived through. And when I think about it, for me, I went through medical school, and I had to I had to um, dissect a dead body to learn anatomy uh, in in anatomy lab, a cadaver. It was you know. It was not an easy thing to be with a dead body. I'm just imagining when you watch Saving Private Ryan, what it was like for soldiers who lived through the blood and that, and then having to identify and bury them and get the body parts together and all of that. So there's a lot more with that. So that's my dad. Back in 1944. And even though I've done so much healing, as I'm telling you this now, it still brings tears to my eyes. Because it's um, the punchline here, the best part of my trip was spending a day on Utah Beach, meditating and talking to my father. As if, you know, wishing that he was still alive. I've spoken to him about that then, but, you know, better late than never. So, yeah, I'm a lucky guy. So this is, this is the 80th anniversary of D-Day. Uh, and this, I wanted to read this as... Uh, because we went to this cemetery, one of the three cemeteries in which rested the bodies of men who came from land over the Atlantic Ocean, gave their lives so that freedom and democracy would once flourish. The other two cemeteries were located in Summer and Gleese, et cetera. But these were temporary cemeteries that they buried them before they put them into the American cemetery where they're having the services today. In 1948, they made it a permanent cemetery. So they actually buried them here temporarily and then they moved them to the American cemetery or they sent them home. And when I went to the American cemetery, seeing that every every one of those crosses and Jewish stars, there weren't many Jewish stars, had a name associated with it. It means like they had to, they had to identify the dead bodies in whatever form they were in. Heads blown off, bodies, you know, whatever, whatever that was. But they really took it seriously. And you'll see there were articles about what that was like, what got the men through was how seriously they took it. They knew how important it was for loved ones to know what happened to their, just like I'm trying to trace that. People whose, uh, whose uh, loved ones did not make it, they wanted to know what beach did they die on? When did they die? Where were they buried? And so that was kind of the job that, that somebody had to do. And this was the, there's memorials like this everywhere as for those who've been to Normandy C. And here is the first engineer amphibious brigade. This is at that temporary cemetery. That was the that was the unit that his quartermaster corps went with uh, on on the on the on the beaches. Uh, this is my niece Sharon. Uh, she's a music therapist, and this is the, the cemetery that the guide brought us to. I don't know if this will play, but this was the a touching moment for me because I read the citation uh, that I just read to you. Um, standing at the cemetery. Uh, so this was a, a really important moment because this is what likely where my father was and he likely was responsible 
helping to bury the people in the cemetery because this was the cemetery closest to Utah Beach where he landed, and that was his job. So I don't know if it'll play. Yeah, so it's on play. That's my father's hat. American cemetery that my dad probably was involved in. And I want to read to you the description here. You are now at one of three cemeteries in which rested the bodies of men who came from the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. And gave their lives for that freedom and democracy and once again be restored to the other. The other two cemeteries were located at Sunday East. The 1948 grant conceded in perpetuity land to the children of America died on its soil. Some bodies were returned home while the others rest eternally at the Normandy American Cemetery in Colville, Vermont. So part of the script I think to try to find out where my dad was and try to get some sense of what his experience might have been landing on D-Day on Utah Beach at 6.30 a.m. in the first wave. His job was that of raised registration as a master sergeant part of the quartermaster tour. So that's Jonathan. He was our French guide. Uh, he was very good and very expensive, but Worth, worth every penny because he took us to places that I wouldn't have been able to know otherwise because he's a historian and he did research to find that cemetery. I never would have found that temporary cemetery. It's all covered up and uh, et cetera in, in, the, uh, in the outskirts. So we had, we had a, a nice day together. and Here we are still pointing to that. And that was, he, he had his, his map and he gave us a whole tour of all of Normandy uh historically but we 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 covered a lot of the cemeteries because that was likely what my dad was involved with in in that context okay so we have to go on to the next the next is this one uh this that's when my sister found that so let me open that and then go here this is when my sister found out uh, that he was he, he trained in Sudbury, England, where they trained people for the for D Day that they were keeping secret. And what was most spectacular, although people at home didn't know that my dad was going to end up going on D Day because they didn't tell anybody, nobody knew where they were going. What was most spectacular and surprising was learning that my father was the first wave of D Day in Utah Beach landing at six thirty uh, with the first Engineer Special Brigade, and they didn't do that. And that's when my sister chose to go to Normandy when she did this research. So that's Utah Beach. Pardon? Yeah. So that's Utah Beach uh, today. Uh, and it wasn't like this 80 years ago. Uh, that's me, a selfie with, with my niece. Uh, this is a uh, bunker that the Germans had where they had guns uh, facing the beach. So when the soldiers came out, they could shoot them, as you can see in Private Ryan and all of that kind of stuff. That um, whether it's Point the Ha or other um, uh, battles on Omaha Beach, the the bravery of these guys running into what they had to run into, no matter what, and walking over the, their friends and brothers, uh, dead bodies, bandit brothers. So this is what the bunker, concrete bunkers were like, like lining the lining the beaches. Uh, and this this is just pointed to the uh, memorial, forty one forty four quartermaster corps, which acknowledged that w where my dad was. Um, this was an an article that uh, my sister wrote, but we'll, we'll go through that again. This is the American Cemetery for those who haven't seen, and it's quite a scene. It's it's at Omaha Beach. Uh, France gave it to America in 1940, uh, 48. And then a lot of bodies from the temporary cemeteries were moved here. Um, and it's, it's, it's an amazing uh, thing to see. I think it was 7,900 7, bodies 
uh, a bear. Yeah. Where they're yeah. 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 Three ways. Uh, he died of uh, a heart attack. Yeah. Uh, I think it's 34 days into it. But they said without him, I mean, he basically felt an addition to his heart. And that's, that's the reason I'm speaking for the Yeah. And he was in Utah Beach. He came on Utah Beach. And, and what happened on Utah Beach, the wind blew them off course. So they didn't have to face as terrible a German. Uh, uh, defense as they did on Omaha Beach. So they, I mean, people got killed and it was, they had the same thing, but it wasn't like Omaha. Um, and this is uh, where they're having the, the ceremonies today at uh, from the, the American Cemetery. Okay, I have to go to the next set of photos. Uh, and this is an, this is an iconic uh, thing outside the Utah Museum. It shows them coming off the beat, off that. Uh, it's a statue memorial of the of the uh, Higgins boat and the soldiers uh, coming off. Uh, again, another uh, photo of where um, what they had to do to conquer these beaches. Utah Beach became a port for them to bring in all the soldiers, and that's how they then battled throughout Normandy to win Sherberg and other towns. Uh, and then you'll see at the end, there's a little sign that says, however many miles uh, to Berlin, because that was the goal. This is this is what won the war, that they surprised Hitler. Uh, they thought that the Americans wouldn't land on Normandy because it was too far. There was another place in Calais that they did a decoy of General Patton. His army was there and somehow they didn't realize that the Americans would actually gamble and do Normandy here at Utah Beach. Uh, this is a movie in the uh, uh, Utah Beach Museum, Victory in the Sand. I'll just play this one thing if it comes to me. The other thing to realize is not only was there uh, weapons and guns firing from the beach, but the land and the air was also firing. And what happened at Utah Beach, they missed their target and they didn't do the Germans. They did the beach in front of them, which made it easier for the Germans to come even closer which is why Omaha Beach got slaughtered. So they're getting guns coming this way and over their head because the boats in the water were firing to, to kill the Germans and there was a lot of bombs. So it was uh, relative relative chaos is, is my sense of that. And again, this is a nice view of, of, of the plan. It's called Operation Overlord that was planned by Eisenhower. This is winning the war and planning all this made Eisenhower a hero and uh, a president for for two terms. Uh, more of that. What it was like coming in? 
So I just took a couple of photos in that and confronts Utah Beach. I got to go to the next set of photos. Okay. So first success was at Utah Beach because that was the first wave. Omaha Beach was after. So they, they sent them in, in, in different waves. 6.30 was on uh, Utah Beach. 7 was Omaha Beach. So they were doing it uh, in, in, in sections. And um, again, if you go to, on TV tonight, you'll see a lot of the ceremonies. They have some of these um, QR codes, a lot of a lot of nice videos and info still uh, on C-SPAN. If you if you put that to your computer, so this is this was more photos from the from the museum. Uh, the lieutenant uh, talks about they they only have two heavy machine guns left in their laurels and the guns. A lot of the different battles and the general leading them uh, on each one. This is the the Germans surrendering. And moving forward, uh, and then they leave the beach and they're moving on to uh, fight in the rest of Normandy. We later went to Avranches, uh, which is a town further south, and um, there they have big statues to Patton because Patton is the one that liberated that town uh, later, General Patton. So all of that part of France in Normandy. Uh, is memorials and, and really appreciating the Americans because they were living under German occupation during during that period. And one of the things that I wasn't as aware of was that the, the French were implicit with the, with the Germans. The Vichy government was, you know, trying to become friendly with the Germans. The Germans win and we'll be in a better position. Although later on, there was more of a resistance uh, uh, with the French. French resistance became a bigger, and that's who Charles de Gaulle was. He was the leader of the French resistance when the war was over. It's when he became uh, uh, the uh, president of, of France. Uh, as as they say, the, you know, viva, viva la France. Okay, let me go to the next one. That's right. The beach, we did that, we did that, we did that. Okay, this is this is about respect for the fallen. Even in death, the unique identity of each individual American soldier is given careful and respectful attention. And this is what I was most interested in to kind of have an appreciation of what, of what my dad, dad's job was like, uh, burying the dead bodies and respecting their parts and their name tags and make sure they got it right because uh, a lot of bodies, they spent millions and millions of dollars sending bodies back so they could be buried at home. Families didn't want their loved ones are buried in, in France. They wanted them buried here. Okay. Uh, so this is, this is the burials that were taking place sort of ad, ad hoc uh, in the spur of the moment as as they were get, bringing the men from, from the beaches. And I think 2,400 men died at no Omaha Beach uh, that day. Uh, and this is the uh, a view of the American cemetery and the land that they gave to 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 the to the states. And uh, a lot of the French um, were very also respectful. There's a, there's a memorial all throughout the the countryside to this soldier did this and this soldier did that. Okay, we're almost towards the end. More more uh, cemeteries and burials and. Uh, this was the name of the cemetery that I showed you in the beginning was was Blues Blues Bluesville Cemetery, uh, which I wouldn't have found otherwise. And this was this was the plan of the Bluesville Temporary Military Cemetery. The Graves Registration Service was responsible for the recovery, identification, and burial. So my my dad's job was not as a soldier who did that, but he was a master sergeant, so he was responsible for leading. He had 200 men under his command, leading them to do the job. Okay. And then Utah Beach became a port. And, there's, and they called it dumps where they would bring the equipment and the like. And this shows them now coming in through the port of Utah Beach. So it was a very important victory uh, to, 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 to get that beachhead. And here's that 
slime that I want to show you. Be closing for this. This here. We're not getting that all right, done. No. Give me a second. Yeah, Jason. Two more things to share with you if I can open this up. There it is. So uh, these are guys after they conquered Normandy. They only had another 687 miles to go. Fight the Germans all the way to Berlin, where they would eventually surrender. Uh, this is me and my niece. These are souvenirs. You, they have little bottles. You get bring back the sand. We brought that the sand for my for my sister for her 80th birthday. There's that. Okay. So and it's the French and American flag together. And one last piece. Um, this was in many articles that I looked at. This is haunted by the dead. Grave digging in World War II was a job no soldier wanted. Caring for American dead during World War II was a critical job that nobody wanted, but the soldiers assigned to the test learned to see it in a new light. So I did a lot of research about what happens to the dead bodies on D-Day. It gave me an insight into what my father lived through beyond just surviving coming out of those boats on the first wave. And it's amazing that I never asked him about it. We had his medals. We knew he was in the war. My sister uh, is an attorney. It was a history professor, and she never asked him. And it wasn't until after he died we started researching, like, what happened. And we asked my mom, and we, we got all of the history. But um, so while you're alive, it's a good time to start asking uh, those, those things. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there, I think, and, and have a little discussion. Oh, and I, I did this because let me just show you this last bit of stuff. Um, we went in, 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 in Paris uh, as a Jewish person. You know, part of this is remembering the Holocaust. Like that's a big part of what the war was about, at least. It was liberating France, but liberating the concentration camp so they couldn't kill more Jews. Um, and so I went to the Holocaust Museum um, in Paris as a Holocaust Museum. And um, that's Anne Frank, and we know her story. And I just like that after everything in her diary, she says, I still believe people are good. So there's something with all of the horrors, you know. And then today, if you watch the ceremony and you see these guys, they're only in the wheelchairs, if you watch. I, you know, it's just really touching. They can barely stand up. They're over 100 years old, some of them. Um, and it just, and they were there. And, and they, you know, they're still, they're still growing, as it were. Um, so that's what, that's what this is. I, I, I just w was commemorating the, uh, because uh, France had a big Jewish population also. And um, the French weren't nice to the Jews during, during the war. Not all the French, yeah, not all the French. Uh, and then this, this, this obviously uh, was uh, La Guerre F &E. and and Okay, so that's my uh, sharing. Um, on a healing note, we all want to know our history. We want to connect with our loved ones, whether they're alive, especially if they're alive, we want to get to know them, find out who they are. You might want your grandkids tell your grandkids about your life, your childhood, your 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 successes, your failures, so they they have in history. And if you remember, uh, remember what Spielberg did with the, with the uh, with the um, Shoah with with the Holocaust, and he ha he interviewed people. They have that now for some of the D-Day survivors. It's on uh, it's on C-SPAN. If you look at the uh, some of the it was nice to listen to some of the soldiers that were there on D-Days that are still alive were sharing their experience and, and answering some questions. Yes. Uh, 
So the, the other part of that, there was a big French resistance too, even though the formal government, Vichy government was in, in colluding with the with the Germans, there, there was an underground resistance, which uh, which is a lot uh, uh, part of the Holocaust uh, memorial as well to share uh, the French that were fighting and battling as well. So it wasn't all, I agree, it wasn't all that. So I'm always, I always like, um, to acknowledge again as well the people who fought, resisted, and who risked their lives to save, whether it's soldiers or, or Jews or whatever. And this is the last part of the, uh, they have a, a a wall just with the photos of all the people of some some of the people who died in the in the in the, in the Holocaust, and um, uh, at 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 the end, that's that's the um, Holocaust memorial in. Uh, in, in Paris. And uh, at the same point that they liberated France and they freed the world and they defeated Germany, it also meant a lot for uh, the, the, the Jewish people. And uh, last piece, part of part of my dad's challenge when he came back from the war, he was a chemist, he had a degree in chemistry, uh, but there was still anti-Semitism in the world and he couldn't get a job in the chemical because they didn't, they didn't hire Jews. Uh, which which wasn't a nice thing. So he had to go back to school to, be, to become a pharmacist. And and part of what I think contributed to his stress was not just the day, but he went to school during the day and he worked in the post office at night to support a wife and two kids after being in the thing. And I think that that's probably also what uh, got to him. So uh, for me, doing this history, they are the greatest generation for what they've been through. Uh, and today's a day to honor all all of them in that way. Uh, anybody have any other remembrances? Yes, sir. Well, I totally remember. Uh, I just want to let you see what I'm saying. Because I was here to take part in the Japanese invasion before the end. So that would not have been because I was, fortunately, an end before the invasion with the occupied and Japan as a stocking or an anti surrender at that point. And otherwise, it would have been me there. So, you know, I watched them as a flag dog, and I'm here today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you are here today. And doesn't he look good? Yeah. And you too, Francis. You guys look great. Anybody else want to share his thoughts, remembrances, people? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's back to the healer that that we need 
to talk about it, even though it's difficult and even though it's painful. Uh, that's that's where the healing is when done in a uh, what's called trauma sensitive way. We have to be uh, careful because a lot of people are afraid. Well, if I do, it's going to re-traumatize. Uh, but the not facing it. So what we do, what we're talking about is widening our window of tolerance, our ability to face it and talk about it and connect and share. And, uh, you know, um, the way I look at it is we, we, we survive the worst. We can live through facing it and healing it. So the worst is kind of over, even though we carry that. But that's another story. Other thoughts or feelings that anybody wants to share? Personal? Reflections. You want to see my niece's video? Would you like to see that? Okay. Um, we just got it. Let's see if I can, if I can uh, open it. Just a second. Oh, here it is. I think it's going to be redundant because it's the same photos, but this is what my niece put together uh, for, for our trip. Oh, that's not the base. Here we are, uh, Sharon and I, visiting Normandy. We're with our goodness, but we guide, Jonathan. Hello. And we are at the American Cemetery that my dad probably was involved in. So part of this trip has been to try to find out where my dad was and try to get some... Sorry. Jason, where are you when I need you? There it is. There's an enormity where... He probably was involved in so far. I still saw it a little. Landing on D Day on Utah Beach at 6 30 a.m. in the first wave. His job was that of raise registration as a master sergeant part of the quartermaster. We found out that he landed with the first engineer. Okay, my step is my dad probably was responsible for organizing the ferry of the people in that cemetery. Uh, Jonathan may want to say something uh, about what the cemetery was and how it was used. Well, the cemetery was used in August of 1944 and 1948 as a temporary cemetery. So then the fall. And uh, getting out to the U.S. He and the American Cemetery of Normal East to, to, to find them in the official burial spot. So then buddy the years, some of them went back home, some of them uh, did in Normal East and are here now forever. So we're out with Jonathan, tracing the steps that my father might have had as land and resistance. A night before 6,000 soldiers, American soldiers, Jews, for the liberation of France. So the position on here, these are the American divisions that are buried here. There's some of the soldiers, 9th Infantry Division, 79th Infantry Division. Immediately upon landing in France, they will return from nearby front lines to the American. This was a mission not cut. I'm responsible as a master sergeant for the federal life. My darling Evelyn and this is, this is a uh, 
This next thing is an and author. Wrote to my father wrote to my grandma. I wrote to grandma and my mom, dated October 11th, 1945. My darling Evelyn and Sheila, this is it. The peace that the world has been waiting for so long has finally come. For us, darling, it means that we'll be together sooner than we dare dream. Everyone was happy about the news because this means that wars in the future are less likely to happen. In fact, will probably not occur at all. Mankind would indeed be foolish to want to risk destroying itself with atom bombs and other weapons equally as destructive. We are on the verge of a new era, darling, an era of world peace, world happiness, and we hope world prosperity. That was me. The uh, German said. and all the clouds talking up the skyway, there's a rainbow. To a place beyond just a step beyond. That was me. Uh... So, uh, thanks for listening. I hope it was interesting. Uh, let's let's close. Thank you, my niece. Uh, I didn't know what she would do, but that's what she did. Which was nice. She did it for me. She did it for her mom. Uh, so, yeah. Now that would that share the spirit of my dad. That was over, and he's he's talking about peace. So, a very good time. Pardon? Good time. Yes, it was. Yeah. So let's close our eyes, take a breath. Let's think of good memories of peace, of freedom. Maybe mirror the the words of my dad to his wife that maybe world peace is coming even though we still have wars and battles but we can still hope and still be positive about the goodness in each of us and in the world and in and frank that people are still good that good is always going to win over evil hopefully people that help in france and save jews and Soldiers. So take a breath and just come into the moment. And today is a special day of, of remembering but the good. The, the courage, the, the bravery, the service of people who served in World War II and Herb is here as well. The greatest generation of people. And we have that in us too. And it is a fight for freedom and democracy. And let's just acknowledge all 
all people uh, fighting for us now and in different wars in different ways and soldiers in battlefields as we commemorate D-Day. Uh, and the service that they offered to us. And then lastly, um, there's somebody in your life that you haven't spoken to or told somebody that you want to tell them. Uh, tell them. Call them and tell them. Or have them ask you. And if there's somebody who's not here, meaning they're, they've gone, they've passed away, and you still want to talk to them, you can. I spent the whole day on Utah Beach talking to my father. And it was more healing than all the therapy that I've had over the years dealing with stress and, and trauma so thank you guys and gals happy birthday francis another 102 uh for sure thanks herb he's a baby he's only 99 he's only 99 okay guys thank you we'll see you next week uh and it's inspiring watch some of the stuff on on c-span today it's it's inspiring Oh, don't tell me that wasn't recorded. Yeah, I'm gonna walk up. Don't let me tell me. I don't know if I recorded it, but I just clicked it to stop and it said recording in progress. Maybe I pushed the wrong thing.